Today we're going to talk about subgroups. To do so, let's review some of the basic ideas behind what a group is in the first place. Remember that we define a group as a pair that consists of a group of a set G and a binary operation, which we'll denote by a small circle, that satisfies the following four axioms. First, we'd like to have closure. That is, given two elements A and B in our set G, the element, A circle B, is also an element of G. Second, we'd like to have associativity. This is a way of saying that we can operate together three elements in an unambiguous way. That is, given three elements A, B, and C, we have, parentheses, A circle B, parentheses, circle C, should be equal to A circle, parentheses, B circle C. Third, we'd like to have identity. That is, there should exist at least one element E, such that A circle E equals E circle A equals A for all A and G. Since such an element can be shown to be unique, we call this the identity of the set. And lastly, we'd like to have inverses. That is, given any element A, there exists at least one element B, such that A circle B equals B circle A equals our identity E. Just like with the identity, you can prove that such an element B has to be unique, and we'll call the B the inverse of our element A. There'll be times when we have to focus on a very specific kind of group, one called an abelian subgroup. Such a subgroup satisfies the property A circle B equals B circle A for all A and B and G. That is, all of the elements in G commute with each other. Let's talk about the concept of a subgroup. This word is actually a portmanteau, or if you will, a concatenation of two different words. We'll say that a subgroup is a subset that is also a group. That is, we want a subset that is closed under products and inverses. This is a certain result that allows us to easily check whenever such a non-empty subset is indeed a group. Indeed, the subgroup criteria says that the following three statements are equivalent for a non-empty subset H. First, as above, H should be closed under products and inverses. Second, this is equivalent to saying X circle Y inverse is an H for all X and Y that come from our subset H. And third, the pair H along with our binary operation circle is a group. We're going to use this criteria quite a bit throughout today's lesson in order to determine when a non-empty subset is indeed a group. Let's give a brief example here that's related to some ideas you may have seen in linear algebra. Recall that GLN is the general linear group of degree n. What we mean is this is the set of matrices that are invertible. SLN, on the other hand, that is the special linear group, is the collection of all matrices that have determinant plus 1. We'll quickly show that SLN is a subgroup of GLN. Here's why. We know that SLN is not an empty because the identity matrix has determinant 1. Therefore, the identity matrix is an element of this special linear group. Next, we know that SLN is closed under products because if we're given any two matrices A and B that have determinant 1, then remember that the determinant of a product of matrices is just the product of the determinants. So if both A and B have determinant 1, then the determinant of the product is 1 times 1, which reduces to 1. Last, this set is closed under inverses because the determinant of the inverse of a matrix is simply the reciprocal of the determinant, and the reciprocal of the number 1 is 1. As a remark, there are actually lots and lots of classical groups that one could study, i.e. subgroups of GLNF. Some of them that you may have heard of are the orthogonal group, the unitary group, or perhaps even the symplectic group. There's a standard trick of constructing more subgroups from just one subgroup. We'll give one of them. Let's say that we have a group with identity E, and let's let H be a subgroup. For any element, lowercase g, in our set, uppercase g, we'll denote the conjugate as the following set. We want elements of the form, lowercase g, circle h, circle g inverse, 
where our H is an element of the subgroup capital H. We'll prove that this so-called conjugate is also a subgroup. First, we have to show that this conjugate, GHG inverse, is non-empty. The reason being, our subgroup H is non-empty, so it has at least one element X. Therefore, the element GXG inverse is also in the conjugate, showing that the conjugate is non-empty as well. Next, given any two elements X and Y from our subgroup H, we know that the product X circle Y is also an H because H is closed under products. So we can write out a fancy identity that says that if we consider GXG inverse times GYG inverse, then this is simply G times X times Y times G inverse, which is an element of the conjugate. Finally, remember that H is closed under inverses, so if X is an H, then X inverse is an H. And it's a matter of checking that the inverse of GXG inverse is equal to GX inverse G inverse, showing that our conjugate is closed under inverses as well. We'll focus now on a few more subgroups. They're called centralizers and normalizers. Recall that the power set is the collection of all subsets of G. Some of these subsets might be G itself, or they might even be the empty set. But still, we'll combine all subsets together because we'll try to look at them all at once. The centralizer is a subset of G that's defined as follows. Pick your favorite subset A of G itself. That is, A is an element of the power set of G. The centralizer of A and G is the set of all elements, lowercase g and capital G, that commute with all of the elements of A. That is, G circle lowercase a equals A circle G. The centralizer is really the set of elements that commute pointwise with everything in A. But if you don't like this, we can write it in a similar way based on the idea from the last slide on conjugates. What this says is we would like to know the set of all elements lowercase g so that g circle a circle g inverse is a for all elements a in our subset capital A. There's a similar definition we can write down. Again, pick your favorite subset a of the set g. The normalizer of a and g is the following set. It's a set of elements lowercase g such that g circle capital A equals A circle G. Here now we're conjugating the entire set. So we can write this in a slightly different way that looks familiar to what we had from before. The normalizer consists of all of those elements so that G circle capital A circle G inverse is equal to capital A. So now what we're doing is we're conjugating the entire set and we simply want to know when we return back to the original set A. Finally, putting these two together, we see that both the centralizer and the normalizer are subgroups of our group G. And in fact, the centralizer is contained in the normalizer. Let's make a few remarks. Now, there are two obvious non-empty subsets of our set G. We can either take the smallest possible subgroup, that is the subgroup generated by just the identity E. In this case, from the way that we've defined groups, every element in G commutes with the identity E. Therefore, the centralizer and the normalizer of this trivial subgroup must be the entire group G. The second non-obvious non-empty subset is the entire subset G. In this case, the normalizer of G is G, simply put because G is closed under our binary operation circle. So we'll make a definition now for the centralizer of all of G. We define that as the center of G. In other words, the center is the centralizer of the entire set G, which is also the set of elements lowercase g, such that G circle X cir equals X circle G for all X in G. Intuitively, this means it's the set of elements that commute with everything in G. So for example, G is an abelian group if and only if the center equals the whole group G. 
So we can intuitively think of the center as a measure of how far away our group is from being a billion. In fact, the center is an example of a subgroup of G, which itself is an abelian group. Let's give an example. Let's consider the symmetric group on three letters. There are a couple of different subgroups that we'll write down. Remember that this symmetric group is generated by two different cycles, namely the three cycle, which we'll denote as R, which is one, two, three, and a two cycle, which we'll denote as S, which is two, three. So using this, we can define the subgroups generated by these, which we'll call A, and B. A here is a subgroup of S3 that consists of three elements, and B is a subgroup that consists of two elements. We can form other subgroups by taking conjugates of these two in the way that we outlined earlier in today's lesson. Let's use the following notation just to keep things a little bit simple. We'll write D G dot A as G A G inverse. And remember that this is always a subgroup for any element G coming from our symmetric group S3. If we let G be our three cycle R, then as we conjugate the three different elements in A, we realize that each of the three is left invariant pointwise. Moreover, the set is also left invariant. That is, if I conjugate the set A, by the element one, two, three, I'm simply left with the set A once again. The same thing is true if I let our element G be the element S, namely the two cycle, two, three. But now elements are not fixed pointwise. If I take a look at G acting on the element R, then it actually goes to R inverse. But still, this conjugate is an element of A again, so if I conjugate by the element S, I still am left with the same set I started with. Things are different, however, if we try to conjugate the elements in B. If I conjugate each of the elements in B by the element R, namely the three cycle one, two, three, then actually I don't recover elements in B again. I actually find a completely different subgroup. So we can put all of this together to say the following. The centralizer of A is A. Again, these are all the elements that commute with everything in A. The centralizer of B is B. However, the normalizer of A is the entire group, yet the normalizer of B is B itself again. In fact, you'll notice that there are no elements in S3 that commute with all of the elements in A. So this means that the center must be the trivial subgroup. Let's talk about another type of subgroup that are called cyclic groups. We'll say that a group is cyclic if it can be generated by just one element. That is, there exists an element X in our set says that every element G looks like it's raised to some power, X to the A, for some integer A. In this case, we'll say that X is a generator for G. And we'll use this notation, angle bracket X, to denote that G is generated by X. As a caveat, in general, there's no unique generator for a cyclic group. There could be lots of them. Let's quickly go through an example. Consider the regular n-gon, and in this case, we'll try to explicitly write out the n vertices in terms of this, these points, p1, p2, through p sub n. Remember that we have a rotation that takes pk to pk plus one, which we can express this way in terms of a rotation matrix. Here we are rotating counterclockwise by two pi over n. Notice that r to the n equals the identity transformation. Our group, now is actually a cyclic group because we just consider the rotations of these vertices. We should also point out that there are more than one rotate generators for the cyclic group. For example, R itself is a generator, but R inverse is also a generator. Here we would rotate in the opposite direction. 
Now, let's try to completely generalize this notation. Let's let G be a group and let A be any subset of G. A here could be the empty set as well. We'll let script A be the collection of all subgroups of G that contain A. And we'll let our angle bracket A be the intersection over all such subgroups. So here, what we're doing is we're considering all of the subgroups that contain A. Therefore, this intersection also contains A. If we have a family of subsets, A1, A2, so on and so forth, we'll simply write the set generated by these various subsets as just the set generated by their union. One of the fundamental results is that this here, this intersection we've written down, is actually a subgroup. Therefore, we'll call this intersection, namely angle bracket A, the subgroup of G generated by A. We'll need to do some bookkeeping because there's various definitions in the literature about what this subgroup is. We can continue to denote angle bracket A as what we had before namely the intersection over all subgroups containing A. It turns out that this subgroup is equal to the following subgroup. Here, we'll consider the set of elements where we simply have products of elements from our subset A, but we're allowing ourselves to raise these products to plus or minus one as the power. Either it could be the element or its inverse. That is equivalent to the set that we can write down of all of the elements we find by simply taking as many different elements from our subset A as we'd like and raising them to any power that we want. They could be zero, positive integers, or even negative integers. And again, all three of these sets are the same. So you can pick either one that you want as your definition for, quote, the subgroup generated by A, unquote. As a remark, remember that each one of these here contains A as a subset. So really we do have a subgroup that contains A, therefore the phrase subgroup generated by A should make sense. We actually use this as our definition. We'll say the smallest subgroup generated by A is either one of the subgroups that appears in the proposition at the top of the slide. Elements of the form coming from A underscore are what we call words. Namely, they simply look like products of the various letters that come from our set, our subset, capital A. The identity element is what we call the empty word because it's what you would get if you don't take any elements A sub K from the subset capital A at all. Let's try to work through some examples. If A is the empty set, then we have to ask, what is the smallest subgroup that contains the empty set? Well, any subgroup must at least contain the identity. Therefore, the smallest subgroup that's generated by the empty set is the trivial subgroup, namely the subgroup that just consists of the identity element. You'll notice that this is very similar to the concept of the span of a set using linear algebra. Here, if our set is the empty set, we simply define the span to be the trivial subspace. That is the subspace generated by just one element, namely the zero vector. Now let's consider the case where A is the set that consists of just one element. Then remember that the angle bracket X is the cyclic group generated by X. So that explains the notation that we have here. Our angle bracket is meant to generalize the concept of a cyclic group. More generally, if A consists of n variables, which we can think of maybe n elements, then we can consider the group generated by this set. We will call this the free group of rank n. The dihedral group is also an example that falls into this line of thought. Remember that the dihedral group really is generated by just two elements, namely a rotation R and a trans and then reflection S. So we'll say that the dihedral group is generated by the set 
that consists of R and S. The symmetric group is another example. Every element in the symmetric group can be written as a product of either a transposition, very specifically 1, 2, or an n cycle, specifically the cycle that goes 1, 2, dot, 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 through n. Now let's end things by discussing something about the orders of the various elements. Let's say for the moment that G is a finite group. And let's pick a collection of elements, A1, A2, dot, 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 through AN, coming from G. If G is an abelian group, then the group generated by these elements has order, at most, the product of the orders of the elements coming from G. If G is not abelian, then this statement is not true. For example, we know that the size of SN is n factorial, Yet the orders of the elements that we generate, Sn, say the transposition has order 2, and the n cycle has order n. So we definitely have a different kind of inequality here. It actually gets worse if you have an infinite group. Let's consider the special linear group SL2R, and let's consider the set A that's generated by these two matrices R and S, as you see here on the screen. You can actually check that r to the 6 and s to the 4th are the identity so that r has order 6 and s has order 4. However, let's consider the following product, t, which we'll write as s cubed times r. You can actually check that t has infinite order. So here's the strange thing. r and s actually generate all of SL2z that is the set of two by two integer matrices, matrices that have integer coefficients and determinant one. Yet, the product of these two elements has infinite order. So we certainly do not have the type of inequality that we had with finite groups. Thanks very much for watching.